Being a part of a close-knit neighborhood is something that many people aspire to. Barbecues, football games, and community events can help neighbors feel a sense of connectedness and community. But neighborhoods can also be places of separation and division, with boundaries drawn between families and neighbors. Join us today for a discussion with the former graduate research associate who has written an article about one Kentucky community that was torn apart by violence shortly before the Civil War as we explore the pages of Kentucky history with Kentucky Chronicles. Kentucky Chronicles is inspired by the work of researchers from across the world who have conducted research at the Kentucky Historical Society or who have contributed to the Scholarly Journal, the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society which has been published continuously since 1903. Hi, I'm Daniel J. Burge, the host of Kentucky Chronicles, a podcast of the Kentucky Historical Society. I'm the associate editor of the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, and I also coordinate our research fellows program, which brings in researchers from across the world to conduct research in the rich archival holdings of the Kentucky Historical Society. Kevin McPartland is a visiting assistant professor in public history at the University of Missouri, Columbia. He earned a PhD in history at the University of Cincinnati, and his work focuses on the American South in the Civil War era. In 2022, he was a graduate research associate at the Civil War Governors of Kentucky. His article, He Has Ever Been Considered a Good and True-Hearted Citizen, Neighborhood and Community in the Wadlington Case, appeared in the summer 2022 edition of the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society. This article won the Richard H. Collins Award, a prize given annually to the article published in the Register that is deemed to have made the most outstanding contribution to Kentucky history. Welcome to the podcast, Kevin. Hey, thanks for having me. We've been talking to a lot of different people who have been here on research fellowships. So one of the things I did want our listeners to know is that your case is a little bit different. Um, You are not here on a research fellowship, but you still wrote an article for the Register which I'll get into in just a bit, because I really, I enjoyed reading it. But could you tell us a little bit about your time as a research associate with the Civil War Governors of Kentucky, sort of what that is, what that entails, and what you did virtually for the Kentucky Historical Society working on that project? Yeah, absolutely. No, I I really enjoyed my time doing this. So it's, you know, I was, uh, like you said, the graduate research associate, and it was for the, I think the official title is the Civil War Governors of Kentucky Digital Documentary Edition, right? It's quite yeah, a mouthful. It's, I think. it's quite a mouthful, uh, but it's this fantastic, fantastic digital history project that it has scanned, I mean, over at this point, 15,000 documents um, from the four different Civil War governors of Kentucky. Um, and what the project does is that it has taken these and it has, you know, scanned them, downloaded them, transcribed them. And then me, a graduate research assistant, and the teams that have been assembled over the years, the editorial board, they go through these documents and they tag every person, place, or organization. Um, And we do research on those. So it was a lot of census research for the people, things like military companies, things like, um, you know, railroad lines and things like that, did research that they can build little biographies of each one of these things. So when you open up a document on this website, You go and it has all these different annotations on it. You can click on, it connects people through story maps and webs uh, when you get to their individual web page. But it's this really cool effort to sort of understand not what the governors were thinking, right? We don't really need any more help on that. They were um, nothing if not verbose gentlemen. What we're looking for is this idea of what was the average experience of the Kentuckian during the Civil War? What were they like? What were their lives like? Because this is what they're writing their governor about. And so piecing together these sort of biographical details and making these story maps um, or character maps, I guess they're technically, uh, is just this really cool way to access sort of the unknown out of these these governor's papers. And it's just, it's a fantastic project. They've got a couple of standing exhibits, I think, on the website still, and they're working on a couple more. So it's just, it was a really, really good time. And so my job was, yeah, I was, you know, I was assigned some documents. I would go through them, make sure the annotations were, uh, uh, or I guess the transcription was was correct. And then I would go and I would do these annotations. So finding the people, finding the organizations. And the random things that would come up on this were just so fascinating sometimes that you got, you got lost in just digging through these people's lives who this might be the only time they ever appeared in an official record. Um, But this one snapshot is such an important part of trying to capture that lived experience. So I really, I really enjoyed it. It was great. It's so many details too. One of the things I've always noticed about what you do is you guys are, I mean, they're transcribing constantly. So it's, it's sort of a lot of details 
But also the thing that gets me, and this is a thing that always kind of trips me up, that you can read the handwriting because it's something that seems so like, okay, you get a document, you write about it, you, you transcribe it, you do this. But when we're talking signatures, it's hard. I mean, it's, it's a hard, hard thing to do. It's really hard. Yeah. And I think the, always the funniest thing, because yeah, your eyes get used to it. It's, it's like learning to read any other script. You eventually get used to it. But I think the funniest thing about it is that all the documents that I go through, the two hardest handwritings to read are always either the most educated or sometimes the least educated, right? Because the most educated, they write in this tiny little script that is barely more than blips on the line. And you just have to like zoom in and pray that you're doing something correctly. You, you know, halfway through a document, you're convincing yourself you're just making stuff up from some mm -hmm. context clues. You're like, no, no, I, I can read this. I can actually do that. And then for the people who are writing to the governor who are, you know, sort of barely literate, they might have decent handwriting, but the spellings are so far off that I, I love doing it because you can almost hear the accent that they're that they're speaking with because everything they write is phonetic. It's like my favorite example is always when they're writing, you know, it was, I don't know, example, it was a rainy day. Right. It's not IT. It was H I T hit. Like they're pronouncing this this word the way that they would they would say it with their accent, which is just fascinating. But yeah, getting to like sit there and read and just you know, your eyes bleed a little bit, just a little bit. It's fine. The signatures too always tripped me up because Chuck was showing me some of it and they're all different. So it's not like you can get used to a, you know, a letter where you kind of, like you were saying, you got to get in that groove of, okay, this is how this particular individual writes. Even if it's not great, you can sort of understand it. Signature, everyone's different. So I'm always amazed that you all can even piece those together half the time because I could not. I will freely admit there's a lot of times I was like, Chuck, Chuck, uh, who's the program director for those who don't know. I was like, Chuck, help me, my guy. <laughs> like, I, I need help on this signature. Okay, so who is this Chuck guy that both Kevin and I mentioned? Well, before we get back to the interview with Kevin, I thought we should take a moment and explain who Chuck is and what he does. Hi there, I'm Chuck. Dr. Charles Welsko, or Chuck to his friends and colleagues, is a project director of the Civil War Governors of Kentucky Digital Documentary Edition. That's a mouthful. We usually just call it CWGK. Well, Chuck, after I recorded my interview with Kevin, we realized that he talks a lot about the CWGK project, and he also talks a lot about you. You piqued my curiosity, but now you have my attention. So for the first time, we are uploading an addendum interview to our podcast so our listeners can hear from you and learn about the work of the CWGK. Hey, that's great. Chuck's interview will drop tomorrow on all of our podcast platforms. Be sure to listen. I know what I'm doing tomorrow. Now let's get back to my interview with Kevin. Kevin was great to work with, and I'm so excited to hear what else he has to say about CWGK, the project, and his own work. Me too. Now where were we? I will freely admit there was a lot of times I was like, Chuck, Chuck, uh, who's the program director for those who don't know. I was like, Chuck, help me, my guy. <laughs> like, I, I need help on this signature. They're so one-off. And then so many of them, it's like an autograph. It's like trying to uh -huh. figure out who signed your baseball 25 years ago. You know, it just, there's there's barely a letter there. You're just kind of hoping that it's, it's close to what you're looking at sometimes. And then Chuck is so good at it. He just like, oh, it's this. It's like if you get a baseball and it's signed by someone famous, you go, okay, I know this person. So if their handwriting looks nothing like, okay, that looks nothing like I'd expect. You can still go, okay, I know this person signed it because it's been, but you all are just working and saying, okay, who is this person? This random Kentuckian signed <laughs> yeah. a in 1862. And uh, apparently their name is James Wilson. Awesome, fantastic. <laughs> But that does lead to sort of a broader question. And I, I usually ask this of fellows, but I'll, I'll put it to you. Were you familiar with the research project or with sort of what CWGK does before you applied for the position? Were you sort of familiar with what they were doing or what drew you into Kentucky and what they were doing in particular? Was there something that sort of led you to apply for it or was it just the Civil War and your study of it that kind of made it interesting? It was uh, sort of the, the yes to all of the above, right? Um, so I was at University of Cincinnati doing my PhD when I was uh, a research fellow there, a research assistant there, I should say. and. When I was designing my dissertation project, I was going to be looking at the South. And I know we talked about you know, that at a different time. Um, but I was going to be looking at the South. I was going to be looking at newspapers. And I needed this way to try to translate how newspapers actually made it into the populace, right? It doesn't matter if a newspaper wrote something if no one reads it. And if they read it and don't care about it, it doesn't do anything for research. And so my advisor actually pointed me to the project. He's like, this is a place where you might want to look for things about how the average person is viewing things. Um, and so I started to sort of dig through the site a little bit. Now, Kentucky did not end up actually making it into my dissertation. Uh, sorry about that, you know, these things these things happen. You can only have so many states in one project. It, it just is what it is. 
Um, but so I was going through the project and just, you know, the detail and the connections. And it's one thing to just have this stuff online, to just have access to. I mean, you can find Joseph Brown's governor's papers online from Georgia, but there's no way. They're just PDFs. They're just, you know, full, full documents. So having this these networks and connections that this site builds and having just the ability of like, who is this guy? Oh, he was a farmer in, you know, Caldwell County, Kentucky in 1860. Like having those little details made, made all the difference. And so I didn't really know much about the, the way it was done. I did not know much about the back end stuff, certainly when I applied for it. Um, but I had known vaguely about what the project was because I had used it a little bit, not much, not, not to any certainly, certainly to any professional degree, but I had engaged with it a little bit as sort of on the scholarly side of it first. And then I got to come in and see the back end stuff. And it was just, it was really cool to see how sort of how the sausage was made actually with a project like this. I was going to ask you if you consider Kentucky part of the South, that's sort of just a for fun question, because that that's the thing that always intrigues me about it is, 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 you know, how does it fit in, especially with Civil War studies? You know, it's kind of that liminal, okay, it's kind of North, kind of South, Union State. The fact that it does not secede, right, but there's still very secessionist pockets within mm -hmm. it. And we all know, you know, Kentucky and Missouri are very different than Maryland and Delaware. Yes. So of those four states that had held slaves and did not secede, those two in the West are a far different place. Um, my advisor would probably smack me like, Kevin, it's the West. It's not <laughs> the South, it's the North, it's the West. And I'm like, okay, yes, yes, Dr. Phillips, I know you're right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating, especially depending on where you're looking in Kentucky during the war. If you're looking on that far, that, that Western, uh, you know, the, the, the Jackson Purchase way out West, that is very much like the South, but places around Covington, it, it's Cincinnati for mm -hmm. all intents and purposes, you know, it's, it's a very different state. So that just the fact that the state itself is so divided, uh, not let alone whether or not it has this, which regional identity it's well which regional in Kentucky are you how does that define your identity it's just it's a really interesting question um, for my project I said that it was a state that did not secede so it is Good it is answer. a border state that's what it is it's tricky though because even when I moved to Kentucky one of the first things I sort of learned was well one of the things that shocked me Cincinnati is so close like, it was just like, I saw all these Reds fans and I was, I remember just going about and, you know, you're in Lexington, you're kind of just moving about and then you're like, wait, why is everyone a Reds fan? And then it just sort of dawns on you eventually like, wait, okay, it makes sense geographically, historically, all this sort of stuff. So that, that was something that just blew my mind. I mean, when I, when I lived in Cincinnati, I grocery shopped in Kentucky. I just, you know, yes. it was easier. It was closer. You just hopped across the bridge. It was great. Yeah. But that does lead to sort of what I wanted to talk to you the most about, which is your article that you wrote for the register. So at the intro, um, I briefly talked about the name of the article and I hope our listeners will check it out. It's up on Project Muse. It won the Collins Award, which is to the article deemed to be um, the most significant. Um, I think the official is to have made the most outstanding contribution to Kentucky history. Um, so it is, it's really cool. I had the honor of reading it early I'm working as the associate editor of the register, so it was really fun. But it's a really complicated story. It has these individuals and they get in a sort of family dispute slash just, they sort of go crazy. So could you give us just a brief, what your article's about, who are the key players? I know it's super complicated. You don't have to sort of give all the details. Um, hopefully our listeners will get the article and, and check it out because it does, it kind of teases it all out. But just for our listeners, what what is this dispute? And you're right, it's a very, very convoluted, complicated story that, you know, revolves around things like kinship and generational wealth and sort of those things that uh, are, are going to be the driving factor. But to break it down with just a few names, because there are so many names, um, there's there's this guy, Milton Cartwright. Uh, he is the son of, of uh, AJ Cartwright, I believe. Um, we'll use that many names. So he's, he's the son of this man Cartwright. Um, his father dies. Um, his father dies as after he had married a woman uh, named Mary, who is Cartwright's stepmother. Now, this is a very generational divide, right? This is, it's not like he, she was a mother figure to him, right? They are, they're closer to the same age than they are not. Um, but so there is a bequeathment of land. Cartwright, Milton Cartwright gets his share. His mother, stepmother gets her share. She then marries this guy, Wadlington. And so these are our two main characters. It's gonna be Thomas Wadlington on one side and Milton Cartwright on the other. There's a series of land disputes about who gets to control which parts of the Cartwright estate, for lack of a better term. Um, there's a couple court cases, there's some disputes of the will. What eventually ends up happening 
is that by 1860, Milton Cartwright has um, bought out most of his sibling property, but then the Thomas Wadlington and his wife, Mary, own the Cartwright family home, they own the land surrounding it, and they also have control, technically, of this disputed woodlot. Milton Cartwright claims this woodlot, so does Thomas Wadlington, and they're very angry at each other for wanting to chop wood on it. And so in January of 1860, this all sort of comes to a head. Wadlington is cutting timber on this land that he claims is his own. Milton Cartwright is angry about this. He goes to confront Wadlington and then violence erupts. Um, we're not sure who shot first. It's very disputed in the text. It was definitely Cartwright, but I wasn't there. But anyway, so the way that this breaks down is that Cartwright shows up and says, hey, stop cutting my timber. Wadlington says, make me. Uh, Cartwright makes some other boasts and then someone starts shooting. At the end of the day, Cartwright is killed by Wadlington. That is without a doubt what, what happens. He gets shot in the chest, he gets shot in the shoulder, he also gets shot in the head, which is, you know, a good way to do it. And for good measure, someone, whether it was Wadlington's son, Wadlington himself, maybe one of the enslaved men who was there, someone also hits him in the head with an axe. So he's 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 dead. He's he's he's, he's definitely definitely. I had to double him. check that. It's like a horror movie where you just pop back up and they're just like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you got you got to double tap. That's that's what we learned from Zombieland. It's mm -hmm. a it's a good good movie reference. Uh, but so Cartwright is dead. Wadlington is arrested because he he 100% killed killed Cartwright. He's gonna claim self defense. Wadlington was shot in the leg in this encounter uh, by Cartwright, but it's gonna be about self defense. Uh, is the the claim they make? The jury doesn't believe him. He is tried, he is convicted, he is sentenced to hang, uh, which is the juicy parts of the story, but what I actually didn't end up finding as sort of the important parts of the story. So what happens after this is that a petition campaign breaks out in Caldwell County, which is where um, these, these men are primarily located, and also some of the surrounding counties as well. And they send in petitions, they say, Cartwright, this is where I got the title of the article, you know, he was a true good-hearted citizen. Or not Cartwright, excuse me, cool, that's, that's confusing. <laughs> Waddlington, Petitions come in to support Wadlington that say he is a true, good-hearted citizen. Um, he's a good guy, essentially. He wouldn't just murder Cartwright for no good reason. It had to have been self-defense. Um, the language is repeated over and over again. There's some changes here and there. But ultimately, a bunch of petitions end up going to, somewhere on around 70 petitions, I want to say, um, end up going to the governor to say, give him clemency. Like, don't hang him. Don't, he doesn't deserve to die like that. Uh, this was self-defense. We know it. We weren't there, but we believe it. Um, and then on the flip side, there's a few, not many, but a few petitions in support of Cartwright that are sort of angry that there's this petition came in. Like, Wadlington murdered Cartwright in cold blood. How could you possibly think about pardoning him? Don't pardon him. And so I was struck by the fact that there's these two sides of the petitions. Um, and doing the research, I was actually doing these documents for Civil War governors. I was, I was doing these, I was, I was annotating them. This was sort of our group project that we were working on. And I started to look at how they broke down and the fact that these petitions are signed sort of by neighborhood relations. As you're going through the census, you can see one, there's a lot of family names that go through the Glass family, for instance. All of them, except for one or two, end up supporting uh, the Wadlington petitions. They want them to be freed. You see people that are clustered around each other in sort of neighborhood groupings that are all signing this petition um, for Wadlington. They fall on certain age brackets. They fall on certain wealth lines. And then on the similar side, you see Cartwright, who is getting support from very, very particular people. He's getting support from extremely wealthy, for instance, in a few counties. And he's also getting support from the extremely poor. And I was like, well, that's that's weird. Maybe it's this this idea of of sort of the the paternalism of the South, where it is this the Southern master dominating the region around him and even getting the poor white men to fall into line. But the more that I dug, actually, some because of some of the comments that you've given me, uh, the more that I dug, these weren't poor men. They were young men, right? If you look at their father or the person they were living with, they're very wealthy. They have plenty of property. They're certainly in the middling class. They're not poor. So I was like, well, that doesn't really, I can't say that these are poor men because they're not. They just haven't gotten their inheritance yet. Mm -hmm. And I sort of started to piece together the people who supported Wadlington were one, they were very close to him geographically, right? These were his friends, these were his neighbors. They were close to him in his age, they were his peer group, and they were close to him in wealth. So these were people who had very similar ideas. They came from a similar time in a similar place. And for Cartwright, this young, ambitious man who is trying to claim back his father's property that was probably in his mind stolen from him by his stepmother, who he was never close to has the support of young men on the make, young men 
who are also trying to get their inheritance. Um, these are men whose fathers are still living, unlike Cartwrights, but they are going to be part of this gap. Their fathers will die, and that is how they're going to find their wealth. And the fact that these two groups supported these men in the way that they did sort of says a lot about the way Southern society structured itself. It's about these kinship relations, families supported families. And if your father was friends with a Wadlington, you were friends with a Wadlington. Similarly, if you were friends with a Cartwright, you were friends with a Cartwright. These, uh, you know, neighborhood groupings where you are aligned with the people you live next to. Um, and then finally, this idea of wealth and generational wealth, especially is this, this, you can see this as it breaks down along lines of who is going to support someone because they can see themselves reflected in the victim in their minds. Wadlington was just defending his claim as every good man should. So I support Wadlington or Cartwright was just trying to get his inheritance, just like every man deserves. So I support Cartwright. I thought it was really interesting to see how all of this stuff broke down and you sort of read between the lines of the documents a little bit, you can begin to piece this stuff together. And I think that's always the challenge of doing any good project is you can have a really good story. Like yours can start with a really great murder. The hard work is figuring out why that's important. You know what I mean with that? It's it's okay, I've got this murder case and this is really interesting. And I think most people would be like, oh, okay, someone gets murdered, there's blood, you know, they're stabbed, it's, it's a lot happening. But then you've got to go, okay, what does this mean? And that's where it's really hard as a historian to sit there and go, okay, now, now I've got to interpret this and I've got to sort of tease that out, which is, is why I did want to briefly ask, how did you decide to use census records? Because the thing about the article is you do such a good job of teasing out those networks. But a lot of that, some of it's in the petitions because you see who's petitioning. But a lot of that requires you to go back to the census and then to sort of piece that together. So can you tell our listeners, like, what's the use of the census? How did you use it? Why did you find it such a useful source for a murder case that might not seem to be that much related to a census? The census is such a valuable resource. And it's even more valuable now because we can collect so much more information than we did back then. Because back in, you know, ye olden days, the 1860 census recorded a few things. It recorded, you know, it kind of recorded if you were literate, which is uh, here or there, but it records your wealth in personal property and in uh, your real estate. It recorded where you were born. It recorded your age. It recorded your gender. And that was about it. Uh, which was which was interesting. But what what I had learned, and I, I learned this from, you know, different different sources and things like that, is that the census takers, they're walking, right? They are walking around neighborhoods, knocking on doors and saying, can you tell me about your family, right? Who lives here? What is their age? Where were they born? All this information, how much money are you worth? How much money is your wife worth, your son, whatever it might be. It's There's no form that is mailed out like we do now. It was person by person. They hired marshals. And at the end, if you actually get through the census, uh, at the end of each section, they have the marshal signs it, uh, you know, just like completed on this date by this person, which is really interesting. But what I found, what I learned from from other historians was that because it is this walking tour of a place, is that you don't have a map of this neighborhood anymore. You, you can't find a map of Caldwell County that has all of these properties listed out in the 1860s. It just doesn't exist. They didn't draw maps like that necessarily. Maybe you could find one, but I certainly but what the census does is it gives us not only this snapshot of things like wealth, of things like age, right? This sort of just basic demographic information. But it gives us a snapshot of, of area, of, of locality, because we know by doing a lot of studies of censuses that around this time period, you know, about three or four census pages, give or take 100 entries, is going to be somewhere around a three square mile area, which is about how far people would be willing to walk on a daily basis back and forth. And so we can start to understand that this, this set of people, this you know conglomeration of three or four census pages, this is a, a network of people who are known to each other, who are, if not familially related, then they are um, you know, certainly in the same neighborhood area, which gives us a hint at what the social relations are. And then the census is great because you can start, if you look at multiple censuses, you can start to draw the lines of those kinship connections. Most people married within three miles of their childhood home, especially in the South and especially in this time period. So you can look at the 1850 census and actually see that the person in 1860 who was named, uh, you know, making up a name here, Mary Johnson in 1850 was Mary Williams. And the Williams and Johnson families live a mile and a half apart on the census. They're two pages away. And so they married, they became a family, and then they moved to their own homestead just a little bit ways away. So it's this really cool resource that by just names, numbers, and, and sort of wealth, 
you can trace evolutions of time and of space and of family if you just put in sort of the work to to go through and really do it which is just a thing that i had never thought about doing until i came to this project i was like i these are the documents that i have right i need to ask tougher questions of them uh, and so being able to do that with the census was a really interesting way to trace these evolutions of, of the way families were interconnected, the way that property flowed between generations, and ultimately the way that these sort of social and political networks are created in these little communities that never, they don't make a political party, you know, then go out and do something. These are just mm -hmm. neighbors talking to each other. But clearly there's influence there, and the census is a way to sort of access that. It was so creative, though, because the, I, I mean, I have to say, when I've ever looked at it, I've always thought, oh, that's really boring. You know, I enjoy, I think like you and what we'll talk about in a bit with your own project, newspapers, there's a lot of things that I find very interesting. Politics, you know, 19th century, like all that stuff. I see a list of numbers and even, you know, it's just, I don't know. It doesn't seem super exciting. So the way you can tease out in a whole argument, um, were you inspired by any historians in particular to do that approach or was that more of a okay i have this interesting set of sources how can i use them creative creatively or was that just something that you sort of i don't know evolved as you go i pulled a lot from two guys robert c kenzer and stephen ash and stephen ash in particular they have very similar arguments but both of them look at southern communities very small local communities um in a, in a couple of different books most of them focusing on tennessee which is obviously similar to Kentucky, depending on where you are. Um, and so what they do is they do a lot of this stuff. They, what they do is they try to reconstruct these communal networks and these community relationships. Um, and a uh, woman, Carol Billingsley, also has done this with a lot of genealogical research. And she's done a lot to sort of trace these connections and networks. And so I, I took what they had done and sort of the ways that they had, first off, conceived of how Southern communities function. Um, and then with that sort of framework in mind, it was like, okay, this is the way that community networks work. This is the way that spatial relationships have been developed. I sort of took that and took some of their advice um, sort of theoretically. And then I was like, where, how can I find this information um, in the census? And one of the things, you know, combining sort of the, the, the census number crunching research with sort of the more, the basis of this idea of the Southern communities is understanding how what uh, Billingsley in particular she calls them effective relationships is these are not the I mean we all have family that we may or may not talk to that much but going out and signing a petition for somebody is a very declaratory act right that's, a, that's making a statement um, and so if you can combine the, the way that these people made a choice someone came to them with a petition and they said yes I will support this person to not have them hanged which is obviously a pretty big thing and then you can ask, okay, now, why did you make that decision? And so then I was able to take understanding these, there's a relationship here. I know that there's a relationship here because they made this statement in this document. And now I get to apply and say, well, why would they make this relationship? What brings these people together besides this one petition in Kentucky? And that's where I really tried to take that census and dig into it using some of the sort of, I would say formulas, but that makes it way more mathy than, <laughs> than it needs to be. Uh, but some of this stuff that these historians had sort of alluded to in their works, so I was like, all right, maybe I can find that myself in the census um, in different ways. But I think it's also a good path forward for CWGK because I think you, you know, you can use those petitions and it shows the value of them and how you can kind of combine it with other other sources. I always think it's interesting to see, OK, here we have this treasure trove of documents. What can you do with them? And I think that's a good thing with CWGK, especially what Chuck's been sort of trying to do is okay, what can we do with them? What creative approaches can we have? Um, how can we get our research associates to sort of look at these things in new ways? Um, so I am going to encourage everyone to check out the article again. I'll give you the title in just a bit. The other sort of pivot a little here, most times I'm interviewing fellows who are in the building and they're looking at different documents. So I thought I'd mix this question up just a little bit. In CWGK, as you were doing research, was there one story that you came across that just caught your attention or one source that you wanted to tell our listeners about? Is it Cartwright? Is it that story? Or is it a completely different one that you just found to be absolutely crazy? I actually had to put a lot of thought into this because a lot of the, you know, when, when you end up being, if you guys do go explore on the uh, CWGK website, there's a lot of really cool stuff. And there's a lot of so-and-so is the commissioner of deeds. Yes. <laughs> You're like, fantastic. I did run across the, uh, the founder of Drexel University. 
uh, apply to be a commissioner of these from Kentucky. So the more you know. But I had to think about it. So I actually, I went I went back through some of the documents that I annotated. And there's one that I, I remember like freaking out about. Um, it's a petition from these guys, Lewis Frank and Solomon Schiffner, um, to, to Thomas Bramlett, who's one of, one of the governors. Um, and they were arrested in 1860, I'm trying to think of what year they were, they were actually arrested. Um, oh, of course, there's no date on the, on the document, which is frustrating. But it's during Bramlett's term, which does, that actually narrows it down quite a bit. Um, but they were arrested for trading with an enslaved man. Um, so they, 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 um, two white men who were trading with a slave. And so they put forward this petition of like, we're so sorry. We did, here's what happened. Here's what went wrong. But I just remember being struck by it because it's this, it's in Bramlett's time. So it's a very particular time in the civil war where freedom and emancipation are very much, um, up in the air, uh, especially. And so this, this document was just this really cool snapshot of, again, we talked about, is Kentucky the North, is it the South, is it this border state? Well, at this point, it's very much this border state. And for, I mean, it's one thing to talk about this financial economic relationship between two white men and an enslaved man. That's fascinating in and up. But then if you think about it from, I think this enslaved man's name is George Gargan, um, or he might be, let me see, I have the document. I, 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 can, I can actually look at it. Yeah, yeah, George, George Gargan. And he is, you know, imagine his his viewpoint his perspective in this time he's he's trading right this is a thing that happens all over the south all over the time all over all the time and when it it's usually just permitted by sort of the upper classes um until they get sort of frustrated with the poor whites trading with their enslaved people and then the you know the things things happen so that's that's fascinating but for this man to be in this very particular position where he is so close to free Freedom is something that is happening all across the country at this point in time, but not yet in Kentucky and not yet where he is. Um, so he's in this sort of very nebulous space, um, which again is just this, it's the fascinating part about Kentucky during the Civil War is that it is so nebulous. Um, and so I, I don't remember exactly where George goes after that. I think it's the only time that he appears in the record is, is in this. I don't think that we know if he joined the USCT or not. Um, but I found that doc image is so fascinating because you can look at it from so many different perspectives of these two white men who are clearly trading with an enslaved man. They know they're not supposed to, but they say that, well, he told us that he was free, uh, you know, and then we have the enslaved man who is in this, this weird position. And then there's the owner who's involved. And then there is also Bramlin who is trying to navigate the space in a slaveholding state as emancipation is sort of becoming a thing across the country by force of arms uh, here in the South. You know, it's just, it's this fascinating treasure trove of there's so many different ways to look at this particular document and so many stories just wrapped up within it. Yeah, from talking with Chuck and others, and this story sort of illustrates it, there's so many threads that must be so interesting to follow that are so disappointing as well, just because you can't figure out the whole story or you just have little bits and pieces. I don't know how many times Chuck has sort of said, oh, you know, we have this person for this one document or two documents or however many you have. And then it's sort of like, they're just gone and you really don't know. And that's that's also tough because how do you write an article about that if someone just kind of pops in and they're just gone? And it happens so often, especially with enslaved people or, or just uh -huh. people of color in general, right? There's so so many fewer ways for them to get into the record, um, especially of their own accord, right? This guy, George, did not want to appear in this document. He was sort of forced to appear in it because of the thing, the circumstances of his life. Um, I'm sure he would have preferred to not have been indicted for trading with 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 white men. You know, that's probably a thing he would have wanted to avoid. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just it's so fascinating. And yeah, they, they're just flips, right? Every once in a while, you're just like, that's so fascinating. And you'll never see them again, uh, which is, yeah, it is hard. It's hard. And sometimes it's just very frustrating. Yeah, you really don't want to pop into the historical record in certain regards, because when you're there, it's because someone's been murdered or you signed a petition or it's usually something, you know, it's not like, oh, I just on my farm living my life. <laughs> it's like, oh. My neighbor got killed, and this is what I got to do now. Chuck always talks about his favorites are the ones, the guys who apply for the pardon for running a tippling house. It's like, I didn't know it was legal. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. You knew it was legal. What are you doing? <laughs> uh, and also, sometimes when it's, you know, something that seems so trivial and they're getting in trouble, and you're like, oh, I kind of understand this perspective. Like, you weren't yes, doing a lot. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I know we've talked a lot about this article, sort of your research you've done that's been Kentucky related. I did want to give you an opportunity as we sort of draw this to a close, though to tell us a little bit more about your larger research project, sort of what you're doing now, slash what was that dissertation about, which I know, you know, you gotta
dig back into it. So give our listeners sort of a sense of what you do and, and outside of the Cartwright case and, and Wadlington and the craziness that is Kentucky, what is sort of your research focus? What are you doing moving forward? My dissertation project, which is hopefully going to be the book project soon, working on the proposal as we speak. Good times. I uh, got some more research. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good times. <laughs> I'm just going to email you about the struggle. <laughs> my, my, research, my dissertation project rather is, is focused on Confederate nationalism. Uh, specifically through the press. So I was uh, sort of kicking around idea pro- ideas for projects when I was beginning my PhD work. And this one of my advisor and I sort of talked about, I, I had done work with the press before. And I found it really interesting because the press is this lovely snapshot that is anything but unbiased. It is always, you know, driven by an editorial viewpoint, driven by an editor in, in, in particular. Um, and so I thought this is a really cool way to access sort of the on the ground narrative of, of people, especially in the South and in the Confederacy. What I did very explicitly was I looked outside of places like Richmond, um, outside of places like Charleston. That's a story that we know very, very well from the press. We know about the Charleston Mercury and Robert Barnwell Red and all that stuff. What I was interested in, sort of pulling off of this Kentucky stuff, I was interested in how local communities experienced the war. And what better way to understand how a local community experienced the war than by looking at their local newspaper? Because ev- almost every town in the South has a newspaper. It's, it's incredible. Um, and so as I, as I dove into these, my question was, how did these newspapers sort of create this sense of Confederate nationalism? Um, that's in the field that there's debate about that a lot, uh, which is always fun, but that's, it is what it is. Uh, but I was curious at how, how these local papers they were able to tie their communities into this broader nationalism. Um, and I, I, I did that by going through these newspaper sources and then because of Civil War Governor of Kentucky, pairing it with really doing close readings of primary sources from the governor's papers of other states across the Confederacy, which was great because both of these are sort of underutilized resources in the historical field. Because of digitization, now we have access to so many more newspapers than was ever possible. I mean, you would have to take six months to drive across the South to every state archive to go through newspapers. And I didn't have to do that. I could do it, you know, online, just reading newspapers and typing it up. Um, but so what I found in this project was that nationalism was created first and foremost at the community level, that the press is talking about a shared burden of the war. They're talking about, you know, it's not just the young men going off to fight. That's important, obviously, but it's, it's about the rich planter making sure that their families have food, right? If you're going to go off to fight for the war, to fight for slavery in particular, which they're very open about. The war is about slavery. It is about defending Southern society. It is about defending what will come if emancipation were to happen to the South. And so that's why men go and leave. But on the home front, it's also about making sure that those wealthy people are supporting the families of the poor men who just went off to go fight their war. Everyone knows the war is for slavery. If you're going to be a slaveholder, you better support the men who are going to and it's also about women um, supporting the troops in whatever way they could. It's about, uh, you know, knitting socks. It's about sending them food. It's about writing them letters. You know, all of the little things that go in together. So the war effort and this idea of the Southern nation is about connecting your community with a much broader community outside. Um, and so that's how you sort of begin to explain the way that a poor farmer from Tennessee is willing to march to Virginia to go fight uh, because he's ingrained in this communal culture that says this is your duty. You have an obligation to go, just like people at home have an obligation to serve their country as well. The service just looks different. And so that's really a driving force throughout the press in the early part of the war is that there's this duty, this communal obligation to go serve the broader nation that brings people in. Um, And then what I also found was the fact that because it's so community oriented, you know, the South, the Confederacy has asked you to do this. And in return, you'll get the protection. You will get the, the state, all the things we expect out of a nation state. Um, When that goes wrong, when emancipation in particular comes to places like Mississippi, when the Union Army invades and no one is there to stop them, that's when nationalism begins to crumble on a local level first. And it happens in different places in different times. Um, One of my chapters looks at North Carolina and Georgia in 1864. In North Carolina, they reelect their war governor. It's contentious and there's debates about it. But ultimately, they say, you know what? The Union Army hasn't encroached very far in our state. Slavery is safe. And this whole election campaign is all about if you don't elect the war governor, emancipation is coming down the line. Um, They tie it very directly to that. And so they, again, they sort of like say, yes, we're with the Confederacy. Our nationalism is strong because our community is safe. In Georgia, get a very different uh, 
different experience in 1864, right? Sherman comes through, takes Atlanta, marches to the sea. People in Georgia say, I have given everything to the Confederacy. I have given my son, I have given my husband, I have given my brother, I have given whatever, I've given all the food I have. And in return, I got 5,000 cavalrymen running away from William Sherman. It's a lot harder to then keep making sacrifices for the cause. And so it's this local experience that one is the driving force of nationalism writ large, but it's also the thing that when the local circumstances change, that's where nationalism breaks down first. Um, and so using the press and using the letters that people wrote to their governors was a really cool way to get at that of, of who gets to assign duties, what do you owe to the nation, but what does the nation owe to you? Um, these are the things that are talked about and sort of debated. And then eventually when the nation doesn't follow through on their, their promises, you turn your against the nation, which I think is really interesting. It's also a tough topic when you're thinking so many different states. As an outsider, getting to know Kentucky's history, Civil War is confusing. I mean, just trying to piece together, okay, here's the governor, here's the governor, and this is what's happening, and here's the debates going on. I mean, that's that's confusing just to plop down into Kentucky. I can't imagine going, okay, here's South Carolina, here's Georgia, here's Alabama. That's a tricky one. It was really fun, though. I got, I got to learn so much along the way. But, I mean, you're totally right. It, you can look around um, the way states voted for secession, the way they voted for the presidential election, mm -hmm. even before secession. You can look at the ways that who sent the most troops and who's complaining the most. Um, I found a really cool letter from Winston County, Alabama, um, in the middle of 1861, I want to say, uh, where they basically write and they're just like, hey, uh, there's a mutiny here. We're, we're, they're not fighting for the Confederacy. Please send troops. Uh, because Winston County is this very particular place with very low slaveholding. Mm -hmm. It's There's no ties to this Confederate idea. And so these people are actively waging war almost against their own people you know it's not just jones county with uh matthew mcconaughey there's different stuff mm. out there as well uh but yeah it was it was so cool to see as you read so many papers from around the states they have such particular viewpoints based on where they are uh you know north alabama is very different from south alabama which is very different from west georgia which was really fun to get into and start to piece apart and ask questions of okay you wrote this in your newspaper why did you write this? What about your community made you write this? Um, where you were from, all the, all those things. Just, it was fascinating. It was so, it was a lot of fun. And editors, I don't know, my experience with newspaper editors in the 19th, they are an interesting lot of people. I mean, some of them just don't care. They will put down so much inflammatory stuff about their neighbors and other stuff that you're just like, how do you go and print this? And then just like walk around town the next day, like, oh. Right, and not and not get shot is the yes. really impressive <laughs> part, you know? You know, Wadlington had to kill someone because of a woodlot. And you called someone a dirty lying traitor and somehow you're fine. Yeah, yes. it's, it's incredible. And they really do, you're right. I mean, they, the invective, I think. Would be... Yes, <laughs> they're so creative though. Sometimes you just come across, it's like, wow, dude, not only language, but just, that's a new form of insult that I've never thought of. And you can pack that into a single sentence. Like, oh that's yeah, impressive. oh, we don't do it like we used to, man. No. It's just, <laughs> no, the smack talk was unrivaled. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's and it's always so personal. And it's always about the editor across the street too. Because yes. of course they're political rivals and they hate each other and they just, they never stop throwing barbs. It's, it can be wildly entertaining. The, there was actually one that reminds me in Georgia, there were two letter writers sniping at each other in this Georgia County. To the point where even the newspaper editor had to say, all right, we're not printing anymore. This is this is too much. We're not doing this anymore. Which To get to that point in the 19th century of an editor saying, this is too much for me, it was incredible. It was, it was wild. Well, it's almost as if, I mean, not to get too deep in the weeds here, but like you almost have a, a formerly Twitter type format where you kind of, I don't know, at least in Kentucky, I know the ones I've seen where they'll do those barbs at each other, but they're almost just short, pithy little sentences where it's like, how can I pack a lot in a little paragraph that's going to make my neighbor really angry? Oh, um, yeah. But they could pack it in there just really well. It was, it's yeah. almost impressive that you could actually it's, do it's that. Always, and it's always so flippant. Yes. You're right. It's just like, it's, and, but that makes it hurt that much more because I, I said a lot in, in two sentences, but they're barely, you're barely going to notice them. They're going to sit with you. Well, I guess we better bring this to a close, but thank you so much for talking with us today. And um, again, I encourage everyone to go out and check out your article because it's it was so good. It was fun to help edit because it was I was learning stuff. And it gives you a taste of Kentucky. I think a different area of Kentucky than we usually focus on. 
Um, so often we kind of get tied up in the bluegrass, and I think it kind of gets you out of that that zone. So thank you so much for being with us today, Kevin. No, thank you. Thank you for all your help with the article, first off. And then, yeah, thanks. thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. In the 19th century, neighbors did not always get along, and sometimes their clashes could turn violent. Property laws, inheritance fights, and family difficulties could lead to violence. We hope that today's episode has shown us the importance of local history and how the Civil War governors of Kentucky can shed light on stories that have not been highlighted in the past. By telling these stories, we can see that Kentuckians in the 19th century dealt with many of the same issues that families deal with today. This brings another episode to a close. I would like to thank our guest, Kevin McPartland, for talking with me today. Kentucky Chronicles is presented by the Kentucky Historical Society with support from the Kentucky Historical Society Foundation. Our show is recorded and edited by Gregory Hardison. Thanks to Dr. Stephanie Lang for her support and guidance. Our theme music is used courtesy of Pixabay. To learn more about our publication, the Register of the Kentucky Historical Society, or to learn more about our Research Fellows Program, please visit our website, history. .ky.gov. If you have enjoyed our podcast, please subscribe. It really helps us to know how we are doing. You can also help us build a following by telling your friends to subscribe.